Heavenly Father, thank you that your word, whether it's deeply serious and uh, complicated to understand, or whether it's uh, a narrative story that it's easy to uh, appreciate, uh, is always reflecting you. Thank you that it's all Holy Spirit written, and Holy Spirit, we ask you to uh, interpret it to us and open our ears, our minds, and our hearts to be made the people you want us to be. Amen. Uh, in one of my ministries, I had an associate vicar, and his name was Ted Butt. And one of his favorite things that he used to trot out in sermons was referring to the glorious butts in Scripture. In the authorized version, there are 44 separate occasions where the narrative is changed by, but God did something that altered the whole thing. God transforms the world by his sovereign action. However, by the same token, there are times when God is at work, but human beings cross his will. And we have one such glaring example in this reading from Jonah. God has spoken absolutely clearly to someone who is supposed to be his servant, but Jonah doesn't like what he hears and does his best to avoid it. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel, a, or I would feel, a certain degree of sympathy for the poor chap if his problem was that he was scared of what might happen to him if he started publicly telling the people of Nineveh what dreadful sinners they were. But that isn't his issue. Chapter 4 of Jonah makes it clear that what was really upsetting him was the thought that the people of Nineveh might listen to his message and repent. He didn't want to be successful in his ministry. He hated the Assyrians, who were age-old enemies of the Jews. He wanted them to rot in hell. So being instructed to go and warn them of God's judgment was not to his taste at all. He's very fierce. He's much harsher against wrongdoing than God himself is. And there's a delicious irony in the fact, I'd never noticed this before, his name, Jonah, son of Anatai, means dove, son of truthful dove, the creature above all others that ever since the days of Noah has signified peace. And in verse 3 of Jonah chapter 1, the writer no less than three times, he keeps reiterating because he really wants to drive us to sort of think, why, why does he keep saying this? Uh, wants us to notice that Jonah is trying determinedly to go away to Tarshish. And what does Tarshish mean? It means hard. Here's a man who wants God to be hard rather than compassionate. I heard some years ago of a Baptist church which was looking for a new pastor. And as many such churches do, they invited the various candidates for the post to come and preach with a view. And it so happened that two candidates each happened to choose the same passage. Both preached brilliant sermons about the fate of the godless in hell. And one got the job, and the other asked, why did you give it to him and not to me? And the elders replied, well, you both preached very well indeed, but you sounded as though you were very pleased they were ending in hell, whilst the other chap sounded as though it was breaking his heart that that should be so. Last week here, we sang the hymn, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy, which contains the verse, but we make God's love too narrow by false limits of our own, and we magnify its strictness with a zeal God will not own. When we consider the moral and ethical issues facing the Church of England in this, our generation, it's all too easy for us as good Bible-believing evangelicals to condemn out of hand those who understand their walk with God differently from us. We do not have the right to call out against them unless we also have in our hearts the fullness of God's tender compassion for them. We cannot communicate God's truth more than we convey God's love. Some Christians are so passionate about the truth of God that they lose any sense of his passionate love for sinners. And I have to ask myself, and perhaps I can ask you, how often do we become pharisaical, condemning other people for failing to behave as we think they ought to behave, pluming ourselves on our supposed righteousness? And this is the first lesson we take from the story of Jonah. Compassion, feeling with, 
Is your zeal stricter than God's? He is infinitely merciful. Are you? Then the next thing we notice is God's absolute sovereignty. He will not be frustrated in his purpose. We so often fret, don't we, about whether or not we're rightly discerning the will of God. Am I meant to do this? Am I meant to do that? But as we see in the case of Jonah, God is well able to rearrange circumstances such that what he really wants is accomplished. And that's especially true if we genuinely desire to get it right with him. But in fact, if we do belong to him at root, he can even ensure that what he wishes comes to pass in spite of our getting things badly wrong. This story of Jonah is wonderfully reassuring from that point of view. His hold on us is so much stronger than our hold on him. Jonah's is rather an extreme example, it's true, but the fact is that if we swerve away or shrink back from following God's will in any area, he will ensure that one day we will be faced with that issue again in another form. Because he's much less interested in the end results of our obedience than in our disposition. He wants to work in us till we want to be obedient. Are we being, Romans 8 verse 29, conformed to the image of his son. That's what really matters to him. The end results are subsequent. Well, Jonah ducks God's express command the first time, but in the horror of near drowning and the blackness of the belly of the fish, which is a death, he learns submission to the will of God. And even after that, he gets reassured, he starts getting it right with God. Um, And even after that, He is uh, getting it wrong and he's failing to show compassion. He has to learn the lesson again. But eventually he learns compassion also. God will not give up on you even if you blow it completely. Even if you mess it up and fail in your walk with him. And that's a terribly important lesson for the church to learn because Satan delights in sowing despair into our lives such that we fall into guilt and condemnation given half a chance. We fail to trust in the power of God to set us free. The fact is, we tend to take ourselves far too seriously. Yes, sin does matter. Yes, it is an affront against our loving Heavenly Father. But God knows that we're going to fail in our obedience to him in so many ways. Paul says, Romans 7, I don't do the good I want to do. The evil I don't want to do is what I keep on doing. But if you belong to God, he will tax heaven and earth to bring you safely back into his fold, to keep working at in to make the character of Jesus visible in your life. And Jesus said, fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Whatever you do, he wants If you stray, he will come and find you. He'll put you back. He'll bring you back. And if that involves you having to be thrown overboard and swallowed by a whale to get you back where you belong, well, that's just what he will do. With you or in spite of you. And thank God for that. In the end, it doesn't depend on your grip on God. Just as well, isn't it? It's his grip on you. That brings us to the third lesson to be drawn from this first chapter of Jonah. The nature of prayer. God's will will be done whether we frail humans like it or not. The choice he gives us is whether we want to align our wills with his or not. And prayer is the process by which we do exactly that, bring our wills into line with his. It is not twisting God's arm to get him to do what we want. Some teaching on prayer seems to work on the premise that we are trying to pressure God into aligning his providential plans with ours. No, quite the contrary. Oh, yes, we are told in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, Philippians 4. But isn't that wonderful to be able to share the concerns of our heart with our loving saviour? I'm really upset about this, I'm really worried about this, this is something that's weighing on me. Oh, Lord, please, would you do something about it? We can bring that to him. But the wonderful privilege given to the brothers and sisters of Jesus through his Holy Spirit is 1 Corinthians 2. We have the mind of Christ. 
not just our minds. That's not all we're bringing to the thing. Oh, I want this, I want that. We can are actually given by the Holy Spirit the mind of Christ. How does he see it? What does he want to do here? It is more important to be open to what God may be showing you as to his will in the circumstances you're laying before him than to be insistent that he has to fulfill your request in the way you ask. It isn't a case of our persuading ourselves that something is going to happen contrary to all the evidence. We simply tell God the burden of our hearts. And God loves it when we intercede with heartfelt prayers for others with whom we would otherwise have no very obvious connections. Say, for Christians facing persecution in Nigeria or somewhere, for, our, for example. You may not know anybody in Nigeria, you may not know anything about them, and yet you read about that and you feel, oh, oh, I'm so distressed for my brothers and sisters in Christ. They're terrible the things that are, that are happening. And so you bring it to the Lord and he says, that is just wonderful because you are identifying with them as brothers and sisters in the Lord pleading with me says the Lord to alleviate their suffering and as you do so your heart is in tune with my sons he cares like that when you pray and intercede for somebody you don't know have no other connection with your heart is beating with Jesus's and God may or may not see fit to do what we have been asking him to do in the way we have requested but he's delighted to see the character of Jesus being formed in us as we make these prayers. And even if he performs a striking miracle of provision for those for whom we've been praying, we still benefit more from our praying than they do because we are being shaped by the will of God. We are being transformed from one degree of glory in, to another in the likeness of Jesus. The story of Jonah is of a man being shaped by God into the person God wants him to be. He argues, he disobeys, he messes up big time. And yet God, the infinitely compassionate, never gives up on him, keeps working on him to purify unto himself a people for his own possession. And that is just what he's doing with you and me. You can argue, you can make, get things wrong. I'm glad you can't read my journal because it's full of me bitching at God about this, that, and everything else I think he's getting wrong. And eventually he argues with me and he argues with me and I get to a point saying, yes, well, I suppose, well, yes, Lord, all right. Yes, Lord, <laughs> yes, I see. And I, he's changed me from the nasty, spiteful, selfish, greedy lustful, angry person I would be in myself, and he is changing me into the likeness of his loving son. And that's a wonderful thing that's going on, and that is what God is doing. He is not thwarted by my littleness, my selfishness, my lack of vision. God teaches us that his will cannot be thwarted, that he will not give up on those who are his own, however badly we mess up, but will keep shaping us to live Jesus in our circumstances on earth, and that in prayer we are able to choose to cooperate in that process so that as we align our wills with his, so the obedience and compassion of Christ will be manifested in your life and mine. What a tremendous encouragement to you and me is this story of a man who is a spiritual failure. Thank you, Lord, for the greatness of your love and your power. Lord, have your way in me. Amen. Amen.